It is essential to constantly remind ourselves that war, apart from a very few exceptions, is a symptom of madness. Yet war is a disease which is largely taken for granted, considered normal, and unless it involves a large swath of humanity, ignored. How did we allow ourselves to be trapped in such insanity? At the present time, wars are as prevalent as ever. They are being manifest in the Middle East, in Africa, in South America, and in a lesser form, in almost all countries of the world. They are the result of a failure to recognize that killing another is actually killing oneself. A failure to grasp that humanity is a collective made up of millions of individuals, all of whom share a common ancestry and, on a subconscious plane, a common aspiration and destiny. There is no victory in war. War is an admission of defeat. When humans resort to mass killing of each other, we see an expression of failure, never success. Not so long ago, war was glorified, and for the victor held up as an expression of supreme national pride. In fact, such an attitude was predominant in the species for thousands of years. However, two world wars put an end to the hubris. The levels of destruction were so great and so many millions died brutal and ugly deaths that a kind of war weariness set in amongst the survivors. And a new sense of the futility of it all became integrated into societies which had undergone the experience. The world looked like it might have learned its lesson. People had pounded each other and the natural environment into a sickening pulp, and there was no glorious aftermath, just a sense of what peace could actually mean. There were and are still some who find war exciting, whose own lives are too dull and routine to find any thrill in the act of daily living. They look on at wars in foreign territories as extensions of their own angst and frustrations. Such individuals find temporary comfort in watching others die. This condition is more prevalent than many might realize. It is symptomatic of a world crushed by meaningless routine and managed by those lacking any manifest vision of something more deeply fulfilling to awaken starved imaginations. Of course, a history of war will reveal that whole nations were born and dissolved via victory and defeat on the battlefield. It was believed that those blood baths were a price worth paying for the great accumulation of national wealth which followed them. If one was on the winning side, of course. It is sobering to reflect that much of the fine architecture of old Europe is a result of plundered wealth. War is made no less destructive by the fact that it can now be carried out by people sitting in air-conditioned cockpits in Houston. People trained to kill at a distance. People whose chance of being themselves attacked by those they target being pretty much nil. This type of killing is one step away from the robotic soldier, the envisioned battlefield of the future, and a direct extension of the war games kids and adults play on their electronic gizmos. But look, 
It's still the same underlying disease. It's still the fascination with the idea of somehow coming out on top and having it over and inferior. It's still reveling in destruction. Children play war games. I used to play cowboys and Indians. I was indoctrinated into war thinking from a very, very early age. It was just after World War II and life was steeped in the stories of heroism carried out by, quote, our boys against the Nazis. Toy soldier armies ranged against each other across the sitting room floor as parents looked on with quiet acceptance. We soon graduated on to cap guns and staged mock battles around the garden bushes and trees. But nobody got killed in these war games and the ground wasn't turned into a sea of craters and toxic mud by our childhood antics. Other matters eventually attracted our curiosity and interest, and the guns and bows and arrows were dumped, unlikely to be seen again. If mankind would only grow up, the same situation would repeat around the world. Adult individuals, blessed with a little responsibility and the slimmest glimmer of wisdom, would move on to areas of interest that expressed an eagerness to support the world and not destroy it. A wish to explore new horizons of consciousness and not to regress into thoughtless thuggery. A desire to meet and enjoy the company of other races and nationalities and not put a gun to their heads. How can this madness have gone on so long? How can war still be taken for granted? It has been etched into our bones by an endless indoctrination process, a process whose symptoms can also be found in the way we are urged to be aggressive and competitive in order to make progress within the demands of the status quo. How much of what is called, quote, education is about bringing out our creative potential instead of our aggressive potential? And how much is about cramming us with the means to succeed in the most cutthroat world of business and indeed most all professions? We see the symptoms of aggression in daily life and fail to question it. Is it any wonder that we fail to question war? War is the most favored tool of the controlling powers. It supplies the coffers of the military industrial complex with an endless demand for the production of weapons. The state then gets the payoff and looks for another war to keep the cycle of death going. It's also a valuable diversionary tool for distracting the general public while unpopular and controversial issues are pushed through the system with only a few noticing. Of course, a great prize for warmongers in general is anticipation of the breaking out of the mother of all wars. And indeed, the ever-looming threat of genocide never seems far off at the hands of those who play with power, the way children play with their toy guns and swords, but without any of the child's creativity. Today, in the U.S. in particular, megalomania has become wedded with a sort of Russian roulette approach to who might present the next useful target for a bombing run or drone attack. We're being pushed by anti-life forces, some of whose origins are less than human, to see the plane and its people as expendable, to accept lies, deception, and crude power play as something akin to normal, to feel that it is not in our power to bring deep change to a washed out and degraded status quo, to believe that war is an acceptable way of shifting around the totems of power, 
the hour is late. And this should add a significant degree of urgency to our endeavors. Mankind is blessed with deep powers of positive potential. And these powers are far greater than the force that drives the warmongering anti-life minority. We are close to a tipping point in the growth of conscious awareness among caring human beings. The key will be to channel this awareness into taking measures to regain control of our destinies, to rid the world of those who hold this fate in their numb, insensitive hands, to act in unison and defy all efforts to divide and conquer our growing sense of purpose and endeavor. We can and we will put an end to the madness of war. We must not wait for war to put an end to us.